Moon is Green by Fritz Leiber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenever. Three by Fritz Leiber. The Moon is Green. Anybody who wanted to escape death could, by paying a very simple price. Denial of life. Effie, what the devil are you up to? Her husband's voice, chopping through her mood of terrified rapture, made her heart jump like a startled cat. Yet, by some miracle of feminine self-control, her body did not show a tremor. Dear God, she thought, he mustn't see it. It's so beautiful, and he always kills beauty. I'm just looking at the moon, she said listlessly. It's green. Mustn't, mustn't see it. And now with luck he wouldn't. For the face, as if it also heard and sensed the menace in the voice, was moving back from the window's glow into the outside dark, but slowly, reluctantly, and still fawn-like, pleading, cajoling, tempting, and incredibly beautiful. "'Close the shutters at once, you little fool, and come away from the window.' "'Green as a beer-bottle.' She went on dreamily, green as emeralds, green as leaves with sunshine striking through them, and green grass to lie on. She couldn't help saying those last words. They were her token to the face, even though it couldn't hear. Effie! She knew what that last tone meant. Wearily she swung shut the ponderous lead in her shutters, and drove home the heavy bolts. That hurt her fingers. It always did, but he mustn't know that. You know that those shutters are not to be touched. Not for five more years, at least. I only wanted to look at the moon, she said, turning around, and then it was all gone. The face, the night, the moon, the magic— and she was back in the grubby, stale little hole, facing an angry, stale little man. It was then that the eternal thud of the air-conditioning fans and the crackle of the electrostatic precipitators that sieved out the dust reached her consciousness again, like the bite of a dentist's drill. "'Only wanted to look at the moon,' he mimicked her in falsetto, only wanted to die like a little fool, and make me that much more ashamed of you. Then his voice went gruff and professional. Here, count yourself. She silently took the Geiger counter he held at arm's length, waited until it settled down to a steady ticking slower than a clock, due only to cosmic rays and indicating nothing dangerous, and then began to comb her body with the instrument. First her head and shoulders, then out along her arms and back along their underside. There was something oddly voluptuous about her movements, although her features were gray and sagging. The ticking did not change its tempo until she came to her waist. Then it suddenly spurted, clicking faster and faster. Her husband gave an excited grunt, took a quick step forward, froze. She goggled for a moment in fear, then grinned foolishly, dug in the pocket of her grimy apron, and guiltily pulled out a wristwatch. He grabbed it as it dangled from her fingers, saw that it had a radium dial, cursed, heaved it up as if to smash it on the floor, but instead put it carefully on the table. "'You imbecile, you incredible imbecile!' He softly chanted to himself through clenched teeth, with eyes half-closed. She shrugged faintly, put the Geiger counter on the table, and stood there, slumped. He waited until the chanting had soothed his anger before speaking again. He said quietly, 
I do suppose you still realize the sort of world you're living in? She nodded slowly, staring at nothingness. Oh, she realized all right. Realized only too well. It was the world that hadn't realized. The world had gone on stockpiling hydrogen bombs. The world that had put those bombs in cobalt shells, although it had promised it wouldn't, because cobalt made them much more terrible and cost no more. The world that had started throwing those bombs, always telling itself that it hadn't thrown enough of them yet to make the air really dangerous with the deadly radioactive dust that came from the cobalt, thrown them and kept on throwing until the danger point, where air and ground would become fatal to all human life, was approached. Then, for about a month, the two great enemy groups had hesitated, and then— unknown to the other, had decided it could risk one last gigantic and decisive attack without exceeding the danger point. It had been planned to strip off the cobalt cases, but someone forgot, and then there wasn't time. Besides, the military scientists of each group were confident that the lands of the other had got the most dust. The two attacks came within an hour of each other. After that, the fury, the fury of doomed men who think only of taking with them as many as possible of the enemy, and in this case they hoped all, the fury of suicides who know they had botched up life for good, the fury of cocksure men who realize they have been outsmarted by fate, the enemy and themselves and know that they will never be able to improvise a defense when arranged before the high court of history, and whose unadmitted hope is that there will be no high court of history left to arraign them. More cobalt bombs were dropped during the fury than in all the preceding years of the war. After the fury, the terror. Men and women with death sifting into their bones through their nostrils and skin, fighting for bare survival under a dust-hazed sky that played fantastic tricks with the light of sun and moon, like the dust from Karatoa that drifted around the world for years. Cities, countryside, and air were alike poisoned, alive with deadly radiation. The only realistic chance for continued existence was to retire, for the five or ten years the radiation would remain deadly, to some well-sealed and radiation-shielded place that must be copiously supplied with food, water, power, and a means of air conditioning. Such places were prepared by the far-seeing, seized by the stronger, defended by them in turns against the desperate hordes of the dying, until there were no more of those. After that, only the waiting, the enduring. A mole's existence, without beauty or tenderness, but with fear and guilt as constant companions. Never to see the sun, to walk among the trees, or even to know if there were still trees. Oh, yes, she realized what the world was like. You understand, too, I suppose, that we were allowed to reclaim this ground-level apartment only because the committee believed us to be responsible people, and because I've been making a damn good showing lately? Yes, Hank. I thought you were eager for privacy. You want to go back to the basement tenements? God, no! Anything rather than that fetid huddling— that shameless communal sprawl. And yet, was this so much better? The nearness to the surface was meaningless. It only tantalized, and the privacy magnified Hank. She shook her head dutifully and said, No, Hank. Then why aren't you careful? I've told you a million times, Effie, that glass is no protection against the dust that's outside the window. The lead shutter must never be touched. 
If you make one single slip like that and it gets around, the committee will send us back to the lower levels without blinking an eye, and they'll think twice before trusting me with any important jobs. I'm sorry, Hank. Sorry? What's the good of being sorry? The only thing that counts is never to make a slip. Why the devil do you do such things, Effie? What drives you to it? She swallowed. It's just that it's so dreadful being cooped up like this, she said hesitatingly. Shut away from the sky and the sun, I'm just hungry for a little beauty. And do you suppose I'm not? he demanded. Don't you suppose I want to get outside, too, and be carefree and have a good time? But I'm not so damn selfish about it. I want my children to enjoy the sun and my children's children. Don't you see that that's the all-important thing, and that we have to behave like mature adults and make sacrifices for it? Yes, Hank. He surveyed her slumped figure, her lined and listless face. You're a fine one to talk about hunger for beauty, he told her. Then his voice grew softer and more deliberate. You haven't forgotten, have you, Effie, that until last month the committee was so concerned about your sterility that they were about to enter my name on the list of those waiting to be allotted a free woman? Very high on the list, too. She could nod, even at that one, but not while looking at him. She turned away. She knew very well that the committee was justified in worrying about the birth rate. When the community finally moved back to the surface again, each additional healthy young person would be an asset, not only in the struggle for bare survival, but in the resumed war against communism which some of the committee members still counted on. It was natural that they should view a sterile woman with disfavor, not only because of the waste of her husband's germplasm, but because sterility might indicate that she had suffered more than the average from radiation. In that case, if she did bear children later on, they would be more apt to carry a defective heredity, producing an undue number of monsters and freaks in future generations, and so contaminating the race. Of course she understood it. She could hardly remember the time when she didn't. Years ago? Centuries? There wasn't much difference in a place where time was endless. His lecture finished, her husband smiled and grew almost cheerful. Now that you're going to have a child, uh, that's all in the background again. Do you know, Effie, that when I first came in, I had some very good news for you? I'm to become a member of the Junior Committee, and the announcement will be made at the banquet tonight. He cut short her numbed congratulations. So brighten up and put on your best dress. I want the other juniors to see what a handsome wife the new member has got. He paused. Well, get a move on. She spoke with difficulty, still looking at him. I'm terribly sorry, Hank, but you'll have to go alone. I'm not well. He straightened up with an indignant jerk. There you go again. First that infantile, inexcusable business of the shutters, and now this. No feeling for my reputation at all. Don't be ridiculous, Effie. You're coming. Terribly sorry, she repeated blindly. But I really can't. I'd just be sick. I wouldn't make you proud of me at all. Of course you won't, he retorted sharply. As it is, I have to spend half my energy running around making excuses for you. Why you're so odd. Why you always seem to be ailing. Why you're always stupid and snobbish and say the wrong thing. But tonight's really important, Effie. It will cause a lot of bad comment if the new member's wife isn't present. You know how just a hint of sickness starts the old radiation disease rumor going. You've got to come, Effie. She shook her head helplessly. "'Oh, for heaven's sake, come on!' he shouted, advancing on her. "'This is just a silly mood. As soon as you get going, you'll snap out of it. There's nothing really wrong with you at all.' 
He put his hand on her shoulder to turn her around, and at his touch her face suddenly grew so desperate and gray that for a moment he was alarmed in spite of himself. "'Really?' he asked, almost with a note of concern. She nodded miserably. Huh. He stepped back and strode about irresolutely. Well, of course, if that's the way it is. He checked himself, and a sad smile crossed his face. So you don't care enough about your old husband's success to make one supreme effort in spite of feeling bad? Again, the helpless headshake. I just can't go out tonight under any circumstances and her gaze stole toward the lead shutters. He was about to say something when he caught the direction of her gaze. His eyebrows jumped. For seconds he stared at her incredulously, as if some completely new and almost unbelievable possibility had popped into his mind. The look of incredulity slowly faded, to be replaced by a harder, more calculating expression. But when he spoke again, his voice was shockingly bright and kind. Well, it can't be helped, naturally, and I certainly wouldn't want you to go if you weren't able to enjoy it. So you hop right into bed and get a good rest. I'll run over to the men's dorm to freshen up. No, really, I don't want you to have to make any effort at all. Incidentally, Jim Barnes isn't going to be able to come to the banquet either. Touch of the old flu, he tells me, of all things. He watched her closely as he mentioned the other man's name, but she didn't react noticeably. In fact, she hardly seemed to be hearing his chatter. I got a bit sharp with you, I'm afraid, Effie, he continued contritely. I'm sorry about that. I was excited about my new job, and I guess that was why things upset me. Make me feel let down when I found you weren't feeling as good as I was. Selfish of me. Now you get into bed right away and get well. Don't worry about me a bit. I know you'd come if you possibly could, and I know you'll be thinking about me. Well, I must be off now. He started toward her as if to embrace her, then seemed to think better of it. He turned back to the doorway and said, emphasizing the words, You'll be completely alone for the next four hours. He waited for her nod, then bounced out. She stood still until his footsteps died away. Then she straightened up, walked over to where he'd put down the wristwatch, picked it up, and smashed it hard on the floor. The crystal shattered, the case flew apart, and something went zing. She stood there, breathing heavily. Slowly her sagged features lifted, formed themselves into the beginning of a smile. She stole another look at the shutters. The smile became more definite. She felt her hair, wet her fingers, and ran them along her hairline and back over her ears. After wiping her hands on her apron, she took it off. She straightened her dress lifted her head with a little flourish and stepped smartly toward the window. Then her face went miserable again, and her step slowed. No, it couldn't be, and it won't be, she told herself. It had been just an illusion, a silly romantic dream, that she had somehow projected out of her beauty-starved mind and given a moment's false reality. There couldn't be anything alive outside. There hadn't been for two whole years. And if there conceivably were, it would be something altogether horrible. She remembered some of the pariahs, hairless, witless creatures, with radiation welts crawling over their bodies like worms, who had come begging for succor during the last months of the terror and been shot down. How they must have hated the people in refuges. But even as she was thinking these things, her fingers were caressing the bolts, gingerly drawing them, and she was opening the shutters gently, apprehensively. No, there couldn't be anything outside, she assured herself wryly. 
peering out into the green night. Even her fears had been groundless. But the face came floating up toward the window. She started back in terror, then checked herself. For the face wasn't horrible at all, only very thin, with full lips and large eyes and a thin, proud nose like a jutting beak of a bird. And no radiation welts or scars marred the skin, olive in the tempered moonlight. It looked, in fact, just as it had when she had seen it the first time. For a long moment the face stared deep, deep into her brain. Then the full lips smiled, and a half-clenched, thin-fingered hand materialized itself from the green darkness and rapped twice on the grimy pane. Her heart pounding, she furiously worked the little crank that opened the window. It came unstuck from the frame with a tiny explosion of dust and a zing like that of the watch, only louder. A moment later it swung open wide, and a puff of incredibly fresh air caressed her face and the inside of her nostrils, stinging her eyes with unanticipated tears. The man outside balanced on the sill, crouching like a fawn, head high, one elbow on knee. He was dressed in scarred, snug trousers and an old sweater. "'Is it tears I get for a welcome?' He mocked her gently in a musical voice. Or are those only to greet God's own breath, the air? He swung down inside, and now she could see he was tall. Turning, he snapped his fingers and called, Come, puss. A black cat, with a twisted stump of a tail, and feet like small boxing gloves, and ears almost as big as a rabbit's, hopped clumsily in view. He lifted it down, gave it a pat. Then, nodding familiarly to Effie, he unstrapped a little pack from his back and laid it on the table. She couldn't move. She even found it hard to breathe. The window, she finally managed to get out. He looked at her inquiringly, caught the direction of her stabbing finger. Moving without haste, he went over and closed it carelessly. The shutters, too, she told him, but he ignored that, looking around. It's a snug enough place you and your man have, he commented. Or is it that this is a free love town, or a harem spot, or just a military post? He checked her before she could answer. But let's not be talking about such things now. Soon enough I'll be scared to death for both of us. Best enjoy the kick of meeting, which is always good for twenty minutes at the least. He smiled at her rather shyly. Have you food? Good, then bring it. She set cold meat and some precious canned bread before him, and had water heating for coffee. Before he fell to, he shredded a chunk of meat and put it on the floor for the cat, which left off its sniffing inspection of the walls and ran up eagerly, mewing. Then the man began to eat, chewing each mouthful slowly and appreciatively. From across the table Effie watched him, drinking in his every deft movement, his every cryptic quirk of expression. She attended to making the coffee, but that took only a moment. Finally she could contain herself no longer. "'What's it like up there?' she asked breathlessly. Outside, I mean. He looked at her oddly for quite a space. Finally, he said flatly, Oh, it's a wonderland for sure, more amazing than you tombed folk could ever imagine. A veritable fairyland. And he quickly went on eating. No, but really, she pressed. Noting her eagerness, he smiled, and his eyes filled with playful tenderness. I mean it, on my oath he assured her. You think the bombs and the dust made only death and ugliness? Well, that was true at first, but then, just as the doctors foretold, they changed the life in the seeds and loins that were brave enough to stay. Wonders bloomed and walked. He broke off suddenly and asked, Do any of you ever venture outside? 
A few of the men are allowed to, she told him, for short trips in special protective suits, to hunt for canned food and fuels and batteries and things like that. Ay, and those blind-souled slugs would never see anything but what they're looking for, he said, nodding bitterly. They'd never see the garden where a dozen buds blossom where one did before, and the flowers have petals a yard across, with stingless bees big as sparrows gently supping their nectar. House cats grown spotted and huge as leopards, not little runts like Joe Lewis here, stalk through those gardens. But they're gentle beasts, no more harmful than the rainbow-scaled snakes that glide around their paws, for the dust burned all the murder out of them as it burned itself out. I've even made up a little poem about that. It starts, Fire can hurt me or water or the weight of earth, but the dust is my friend. Oh, yes, and then the robins like cockatoos and squirrels like princesses ermine, all under a treasure chest of sun and moon and stars that the dust's magic powder changes from ruby to emerald and sapphire and amethyst and back again. Oh, and then the new children. You're telling the truth? she interrupted him, her eyes brimming with tears. You're not making it up? I am not he assured her solemnly. And if you could catch a glimpse of one of the new children, you'd never doubt me again. They have long limbs as brown as this coffee would be if it had lots of fresh cream in it, and smiling delicate faces and the whitest teeth and the finest hair. They're so nimble that I, a sprightly man and somewhat enlivened by the dust, feel like a cripple beside them and their thoughts dance like flames and make me feel a very imbecile. Of course, they have seven fingers on each hand and eight toes on each foot, but they're the more beautiful for that. They have large pointed ears that the sun shines through. They play in the garden all day long, slipping among the great leaves and blooms, but they're so swift that you can hardly see them, unless one chooses to stand still and look at you. For that matter, you have to look a bit hard for all these things I'm telling you. But is it true? she pleaded. Every word of it, he said, looking straight into her eyes. He put down his knife and fork. What's your name? he asked softly. Mine's Patrick. Effie, she told him. He shook his head. That can't be, he said. Then his face brightened. Euphemia! he exclaimed, that's what Effie is short for. Your name is Euphemia. As he said that, looking at her, she suddenly felt beautiful. He got up and came around the table and stretched out his hand toward her. Euphemia, he began. Yes, she answered huskily, shrieking from him a little, but looking up sideways and very flushed. Don't either of you move. Hank said. The voice was flat and nasal, because Hank was wearing a nose respirator that was just long enough to suggest an elephant's trunk. In his right hand was a large, blue-black automatic pistol. They turned their faces to him. Patrick's was abruptly alert, shifty, but Effie's was still smiling tenderly, as if Hank could not break the spell of the magic garden, and should be pitied for not knowing about it. "'You little!' Hank began with an almost gleeful fury, calling her several shameful names. He spoke in short phrases, closing tight his unmasked mouth between them, while he sucked in breath through the respirator. His voice rose in a crescendo. And not with a man of the community, but a pariah, a pariah. I hardly know what you're thinking, man, but you're quite wrong. Patrick took the opportunity to put in hurriedly, conciliatingly. I just happened to be coming by, hungry tonight, a lonely tramp, and knocked at the window. Your wife was a bit foolish, and let kind-heartedness get the better of prudence. "'Don't think you've pulled the wool over my eyes, Effie,' 
Hank went on with a screechy laugh, disregarding the other man completely. Don't think I don't know why you're suddenly going to have a child after four long years. At that moment the cat came nosing up to his feet. Patrick watched him narrowly, shifting his weight forward a little, but Hank only kicked the animal aside without taking his eyes off them. Even that business of carrying the wrist watch in your pocket instead of on your arm, he went on with channeled hysteria. A neat bit of camouflage, Jeffy, very neat. And telling me it was my child, when all the while you've been seeing him for months. Man, you're mad. I've not touched her, Patrick denied hotly, though still calculatingly, and risked a step forward, stopping when the gun instantly swung his way. Pretending you were going to give me a healthy child, Hank raved on, when all the while you knew it would be either in body or germ plasma, a thing like that. He waved his gun at the malformed cat, which had leaped to the top of the table and was eating the remains of Patrick's food, though its watchful green eyes were fixed on Hank. "'I should shoot him down!' Hank yelled, between sobbing, chest-racking inhalations through the mask. "'I should kill him this, this instant for the contaminated pariah he is!' All this while Effie had not ceased to smile compassionately. Now she stood up without haste and went to Patrick's side. Disregarding his warning, apprehensive glance, she put her arm lightly around him and faced her husband. Then you'd be killing the bringer of the best news we've ever had, she said, and her voice was like a flood of some warm, sweet liquor in that musty, hate-charged room. Oh, Hank! Forget your silly wrong jealousy and listen to me. Patrick here has something wonderful to tell us. Hank stared at her. For once he screamed no reply. It was obvious that he was seeing for the first time how beautiful she had become, and that the realization jolted him terribly. What do you mean? he finally asked unevenly, almost fearfully. I mean that we no longer need to fear the dust, she said, and now her smile was radiant. It never really did hurt people the way the doctor said it would. Remember how it was with me, Hank, the exposure I had and recovered from, although the doctor said I wouldn't at first, and without even losing my hair? Hank, those who are brave enough to stay outside, and who weren't killed by terror and suggestion and panic, they adapted to the dust. They changed. But they changed for the better. Everything— Effie, he told you lies, Hank interrupted, but still in that same agitated, broken voice, cowed by her beauty. Everything that grew or moved was purified, she went on ringingly. You men going outside have never seen it, because you've never had eyes for it. You've been blinded to beauty, to life itself. And now all the power in the dust has gone and faded anyway, burned itself out. That's true, isn't it? She smiled at Patrick for confirmation. His face was strangely veiled, as if he were calculating obscure changes. He might have given a little nod. At any rate, Effie assumed that he did, for she turned back to her husband. You see, Hank? We can all go out now. We need never fear the dust again. Patrick is a living proof of that, she continued triumphantly, standing straighter, holding him a little tighter. Look at him! Not a scar or a sign, and he's been out in the dust for years. How could he be this way if the dust hurt the brave? Oh, believe me, Hank, believe what you see. Test it if you want. Test Patrick here. "'Effie, you're all mixed up. You don't know,' Hank faltered, but without conviction of any sort. "'Just test him,' Effie repeated with utter confidence, ignoring, not even noticing, Patrick's warning nudge. "'All right,' Hank mumbled. 
He looked at the stranger dully. Can you count? he asked. Patrick's face was a complete enigma. Then he suddenly spoke, and his voice was like a fencer's foil, light, bright, alert, constantly playing, yet utterly on guard. Can I count? <laughs> Do you take me for a complete simpleton man? Of course I can count. Then count yourself, Hank said, barely indicating the table. Count myself, should I? The other retorted with a quick, facetious laugh. Is this a kindergarten? But if you want me to, I'm willing. His voice was rapid. I've two arms, two legs, that's a four, and ten fingers and ten toes. You'll take my word for them. That's twenty-four, a head, twenty-five, and two eyes, and a nose, and a mouth. With this, I mean. Hank said heavily, advanced to the table, picked up the Geiger counter, switched it on, and handed it across the table to the other man. But while it was still an arm's length from Patrick, the clicks began to mount furiously until they were like the chatter of a pygmy machine gun. Abruptly the clicks slowed, but that was only the counter shifting to a new scaling circuit, in which every click stood for five hundred and twelve of the old ones. With those horrid, rattling little volleys, fear cascaded into the room and filled it, smashing like so much colored glass all the bright barriers of words Effie had raised against it. For no dreams can stand against the Geiger counter, the twentieth century's mouthpiece of ultimate truth. It was as if the dust and all the terrors of the dust had incarnated themselves in one dread invading shape that said in words stronger than audible speech, Those were illusions, whistles in the dark. This is reality, the dreary, pitiless reality of the burrowing years. Hank scuttled back to the wall. Through chattering teeth he babbled, "'Enough radioactives! Kill a thousand men! Freak! A freak!' In his agitation he forgot for a moment to inhale through the respirator. Even Effie, taken off guard, all the fears that had been drilled into her twanging like piano wires, shrank from the skeletal-seeming shape beside her, held herself to it only by desperation. Patrick did it for her. He disengaged her arm and stepped briskly away. Then he whirled on them, smiling sardonically, and started to speak, but instead looked with distaste at the chattering Geiger counter he held between fingers and thumb. "'Have we listened to this racket long enough?' he asked. Without waiting for an answer, he put down the instrument on the table. The cat hurried over to it curiously, and the clicks began again to mount to a minor crescendo. Effie lunged for it frantically. She switched it off, darted back. "'That's right,' Patrick said with another chilling smile. "'You do well to cringe, for I'm death itself. Even in death I could kill you like a snake.' And with that his voice took on the tones of a circus barker. "'Yes, I'm a freak, as the gentleman so wisely said. That's what one doctor who dared talk with me for a minute told me before he kicked me out. He couldn't tell me why, but somehow the dust doesn't kill me. Besides, I'm a freak, you see, just like the men who ate nails and walked on fire and ate arsenic and suck themselves through with pins. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen, only not too close, and examine the man that dust can't harm. Rappacini's child brought up to date. His embrace, death. And now, he said, breathing heavily, I'll get out and leave you in your damned lead cave. He started toward the window. Hank's gun followed him shakingly. Wait! Effie called in an agonized voice. He obeyed. She continued falteringly. When we were together earlier, you didn't act as if— 
When we were together earlier, I wanted what I wanted, he snarled at her. You don't suppose I'm a bloody saint, do you? And all the beautiful things you told me? That, he said cruelly, is just the line I've found that women fall for. They're all so bored and so starved for beauty, as they generally put it. <laughs> Even the garden? Her question was barely audible through the sobs that threatened to suffocate her. He looked at her, and perhaps his expression softened a trifle. "'What's outside?' he said flatly. "'Is just a little worse than either of you can imagine.' He tapped his temple. "'The garden's all here.' <laughs> "'You've killed it,' she wept. "'You've killed it in me. "'You've both killed everything that's beautiful, but you're worse,' she screamed at Patrick. "'Because he only killed beauty once, but you brought it to life just so you could kill it again. "'Oh, I can't stand it. I won't stand it.' And she began to scream. Patrick started toward her, but she broke off and whirled away from him to the window, her eyes crazy. "'You've been lying to us,' she cried. "'The garden's there. I, I know it is. But you don't want to share it with anyone.' "'No, no, Euphemia,' Patrick protested anxiously. "'It's hell out there, believe me. I wouldn't lie to you about it.' "'Wouldn't lie to me?' she mocked. "'Are you afraid, too?' With a sudden pull, she jerked open the window and stood before the blank, green-tinged oblong of darkness that seemed to press into the room like a menacing, heavy, wind-urged curtain. At that, Hank cried out a shocked, pleading, "'Effie!' She ignored him. "'I can't be cooped up here any longer,' she said. And I won't. Now that I know, I'm going to the garden. Both men sprang at her, but they were too late. She leaped lightly to the sill, and by the time they had flung themselves against it, her footsteps were already hurrying off into the darkness. Effie, come back, come back! Hank shouted after her desperately, no longer thinking to cringe from the man beside him, or how the gun was pointed. I love you, Effie. Come back. Patrick added his voice. Come back, Euphemia. You'll be safe if you come back right away. Come back to your home. No answer to that at all. They both strained their eyes through the greenish murk. They could barely make out a shadowy figure about half a block down the near black canyon of the dismal, dust-blown street into which the greenish moonlight hardly reached. It seemed to them that the figure was scooping something up from the pavement and letting it sift down along its arms and over its bosom. "'Go out and get her, man,' Patrick urged the other. "'For if I go out for her, I warn you, I won't bring her back.' She said something about having stood the dust better than most, and that's enough for me. But Hank— chained by his painfully learned habits and by something else, could not move. And then a ghostly voice came whispering down the street, chanting, Fire can hurt me, or water, or the weight of the earth, but the dust is my friend. Patrick spared the other man one more look. Then, without a word, he vaulted up and ran off. Hank stood there. After perhaps half a minute, he remembered to close his mouth when he inhaled. Finally, he was sure the street was empty. As he started to close the window, there was a little meow. He picked up the cat and gently put it outside. Then he did close the window and the shutters and bolted them, and took up the Geiger counter, and mechanically began to count himself. End of The Moon is Green by Fritz Leiber This recording by Phil Chenevere